everybody, and welcome to this uh, session about uh, a data storage diode for classified sites. So I'm Jean-Baptiste Rio from uh, Carré, located in France. Uh, so Carré at SDC20 uh, this year will be presenting uh, four, four sessions and mostly about uh, NVMe OF and uh, composable architecture. So you will also meet my two colleagues, Jean-Francois Marie and Rémi Coguet during the three next presentation. So this presentation is about uh, a storage diode. So the need uh, came from one of our customers, which had a very specific uh, needs for, for its site. So the site is a dark site. I will define what, what is a dark site a bit later. Uh, and they, need, they needed a solution to, uh, to, to, to push data outside the, the dark side to the outside world in a secure way. And we will see all the constraints, which we are defined a bit later. But the idea is really to have a dedicated pass uh, with guaranteed read-only access from the, from the outside world uh, to, to some data pushed on the node in, on the dark side. Uh, as I said, I'm Jean-Baptiste Rio. I'm a senior field application engineer in Carré for the data center business unit. Uh, I came from the HPC world uh, because before joining Carré, I was uh, in DDN and Intel doing mostly uh, SAN deployment, file system installation, benchmarking, troubleshooting. And also I joined Intel to do uh, only luster for a couple of years and support for a classified site in France. So some context about classified site and HPC. So what, what is an HPC dark site? So a dark site, first a dark site is a classified data center close from the outside world. It's an HPC dark site, it's an HPC a cluster in a data center which is closed from the outside world. So it means there is uh, no internet access. Uh, people who can enter the site are selected and filtered. Um, and so an HPC cluster is basically a compute cluster sharing a unique file system uh, between all its nodes. We will find thousands of uh, compute nodes or client nodes uh, connected to uh, a parallel file system through IO nodes. Uh, these IO nodes generally are separated in two types of nodes, uh, metadata server and data server, and they serve file systems such as Luster or GPFS or BGFS. And uh, the sizing is uh, multiple petabytes of data for the largest sites in the world. For a few, for a few years, we also find sometimes uh, GPU farms and specialized nodes for AI workloads. So the challenges on the dark side is that uh, as there is no internet access or no VPN access, uh, it's not easy to, to push data outside the dark side. And as, uh, as you, you are certainly aware, uh, dark sites and HPC dark sites are very often uh, collaborative sites and a few users or few companies have a remote access to the cluster. So they will generate data uh, after all the compute is done and the generated data is not intended for uh, internal use. Uh, people using the, the HPC compute cluster needs to, to, to have access to their data outside the dark side. The way we can uh, take some data out of the sites are very limited today. So you can do a control copy on drive. So it means that uh, the researcher or scientists have to uh, extract all the results uh, they need from their, from their experience. And it has to be controlled by a third party and validated so uh, the drive can be off-site. Uh, you can also find sometimes special notes outside for remote copy using a multiple layer of encryption. So I'm thinking about uh, dedicated nodes outside the dark side, uh, connected to the dark side through an IPsec tunnel or this kind of thing, where you push only uh, encrypted data. And very often we find also a direct optical link between uh, the dark side and outside 
of the site. Uh, so very often a close location, uh, maybe a few hundred meters uh, from the dark side. So uh, a direct link is, is a secure way to, to push some data outside. So what is an HPC cluster? So a few, a few, a few words about that, just so everybody can understand what we will be speaking about. So this represents a typical HPC cluster. On the left, you will find the compute nodes, which are uh, interconnected between them to, uh, to InfiniBand, uh, which is uh, serving the Luster or GPFS or any other parallel file system from data and metadata servers. Uh, these servers will be uh, connected to a SAN storage, uh, such as uh, JBOF, JBOD uh, to serve the data. Uh, between th this type of server and the storage, we will find uh, technologies such as SAS, fiber channel, uh, simple RDMA protocol, or NVMe. Um, also, all compute nodes and uh, IO nodes are connected to an admin network, uh, which will be operated internally in the dark side. Um, and so, uh, of course, to do a storage diode, we can't afford to have a node connected to the same network. It would be uh, uh, a security issue. And so, what is an HPC file system? So, an HPC file system is basically a file system shared between all compute uh, and client nodes in the HPC cluster. Uh, says they already see one namespace which is unique between all nodes. Uh, sometimes between uh, the parallel file system servers and the compute nodes, we'll find a burst buffer uh, which allows to have tons of performances for small IOPS, which is not the best use case for HPC file systems. Uh, yeah, so about the technology. Uh, between the data server and the storage, uh, most of the time uh, we will find a fabric or sometimes it can be also a direct attached solution. And for the meta metadata servers, it's usually only direct attached uh, system such as um, a JBOF or FBOF. So the limitation we faced uh, for the diode requirements um, is that we can't be connected to the parallel file system. Uh, the outside node can't have access to the parallel file system namespace, which is kind of obvious. Uh, it can't be connected to the same admin network. Uh, it could be a security flow. And also, it can't be a file-based access protocol. Uh, so it means it can't be network-based. So you can't have a classical, uh, I don't know, CIFS or stuff like this. Uh, encapsulated it to IP to push this out in the outside world. So the only remaining solution was a block-based access solution. So how can Calve help with this uh, project? Uh, so let's speak about our last processor named Coolidge. So Coolidge, compared to the traditional CPU and GPU approach, is a fully programmable processor. Uh, its uh, name is MPPA. Uh, we have a control plane and a data plane, which is based now on SPDK. And uh, we target to be an open platform be before the end of year, so our partner can contribute to the code base, and the code base can uh, grow in the, in the near future. Uh, the, the chip Coolidge is composed of 80 cores, uh, which are gathered into five clusters of 16 cores. Each core runs at 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, and also each core, which is very important, embark a crypto accelerator, so which uh, allows us to develop features such as erasure coding. Um, each core is a very long instruction board 64-bit core, uh, as you can see here on the schema. Uh, a cluster is composed, as we said, of 16 cores. And also, uh, each cluster embarks uh, a static memory or shared memory, which is uh, basically a L1 cache. But this memory is configurable, 
So you can use it as uh, L1 cache uh, dedicated to this cluster without uh, any L2, but you can also uh, split this memory into an L1 cache and an L2 cache, which will be coherent between the clusters. So our uh, the five cluster composed uh, the entire chip, and the five cluster are, uh, have each 16 cores for a total of 80 cores. And so we have so 80 core processor, uh, uh, basically for crypto acceleration. So the board also embarks two 200 gigs uh, Ethernet interfaces. It supports PCI, PCI Gen 4. Uh, we have one uh, 16 lane uh, on, on the board, and uh, the DDR embarked on the board is uh, DDR4 at uh, 3.2 GHz. Uh, another specific part of the chip is that we have a, uh, a protocol uh, named Network on Chip, which allows uh, very fast inter cluster communication. So our card so K200 can be seen also as a smart storage adapter because it can serve to many purposes. So uh, in our case, what is interesting for the for the storage diode is that we are it's an NVMe wave uh, solution. It can be an NVMe solution, so it means we offload uh, inside the MPPR clusters uh, the network stacks such as TCP and WoP. Uh, the NVMe drives uh, will be uh, connected to the by PCI, so basically it will be U.2 drives in JBOF or FBOF. Uh, as our card acts as a root complex, uh, as a PCI root complex, sorry. So it's, uh, the card also offers a uh, gigabit Ethernet management interface and a, standard, and a standard REST API, which is compatible with uh, Swordfish and Redfish. Also, as a control plane with Linux days, and it has a gigabit Ethernet interface, it can be also managed by SSH, so it should be pretty easy to develop uh, scripts to support traditional HPC systems such as uh, Puppets or NCD uh, for deployment and, uh, and configuration management. Also, uh, our board uh, can be used uh, in uh, two different ways, which is uh, very important. It can, it can act as a root complex and be so the PCI master. Or it can be also a PCI endpoint and be inserted into any type of uh, server or any PCI equipment which offers a lot of complexity. Also, uh, our last release supports both NVMe drives and SAS drives. So it allows us to build solution with uh, mixed drives inside uh, a drive shelf or a drive enclosure. Uh, so, as we said, uh, the K200 supports two modes, uh, root complex and standalone, uh, root complex and endpoint, sorry. So, standalone is really to build a solution on the top of the card, which will be uh, the PCI root complex. So, typically, if you want to put the card in, into a JBOF or do any type of uh, standalone equipment, so, such as a, a firewall or a QoS, uh, the QoS filtering specific traffic. Uh, a few words about the performances as well. So, in, uh, for our NVMeOF uh, solution, in Roti, uh, we can reach uh, 6 million IOPS on one board and in TCP uh, up to 4 million IOPS, which is uh, not too bad. <laughs> And so, as we said earlier, we have uh, a control, pay, control plane based on SPDK, which runs on 16 cores, and the rest of the board are uh, is a data plane. So, you have 64 cores available on four clusters, and depending on the need and the project, uh, each, core, each cluster can run a different type of, uh, of code. So for NVMe OF, uh, basically the, the four cluster will be used to serve uh, either OT or TCP. So uh, it's, uh, one of the advantages of, uh, of our card is the programming 
programmability. So it's fully programmable uh, and uh, it's uh, kind of uh, easy to program and very uh, efficient. Uh, you can have a separate uh, type of program in each cluster. So it means you can use uh, one cluster to run uh, NVMe OF or Rocky, for example, uh, one cluster dedicated to encryption. Uh, and you can have also two uh, available cluster for later use uh, if you need to scale in the future, for example. Uh, also, we offer standard, standardized interfaces. So, as we said, uh, the Linux APIs are pretty standard. So, uh, it's SPDK based. Uh, we find reports of uh, ID verbs, Notio, uh, open data plane supports, and stuff like that. And also, our Erasure coding implementation is based on the ISA L uh, library from Intel, which is uh, also available uh, freely. So, Carre offers a fully flexible software environment. Uh, it's completely modular, and the control plane and data plane is now based on SPDK, uh, and it's open to partner, and we target to be an open platform before the end of year. So, we will benefit of this, uh, because more and more people will be able to contribute to our code base. So here is an example of a working implementation uh, based on the K200. So this is a, a Wistron JBOF called, uh, called Lima, which will be available for sale uh, at the end of this year. So it's a JBOF chassis in standalone. Uh, it's a standard to you. Uh, you can embark up to 24 new V2 drives, NVMe, of course. Uh, there are six PCIe Gen 3 X by 16 ports inside the JBOF, so it means you can uh, configure, choose to put between two and six cards inside the, the JBOF, depending on the number of drives and the performance uh, you want to achieve. Uh, the base BMC chip is a standard AST uh, 2500 uh, and uh, so the, the, the JBOF can be managed to a standard one gig interface based on the open beams. So this uh, JBOF embarking a carry card, K200, uh, can be used both in TCP or Rocky. So uh, about a few words about an efficient composable disaggregated infrastructure. So uh, Carry cars uh, exploits NVMe SSD at their full capacities uh, because of the million IOPS we can support. Also, uh, very important, we offload the x86 from a really heavy storage stack. Everything is done inside the NPPA cluster. Uh, our solution, as we said earlier, is uh, fully programmable. Uh, based on SPDK, and also uh, we are future proof and ready for the future as everything is uh, NVMe OF uh, uh, compatible and uh, and based on the standard. So our solution can work with other uh, NVMe OF appliances. Uh, it was uh, tested uh, in two IOL labs as an inter interoperability laboratory. And also, uh, it's very, really easy to update on the field tools uh, through the one gig interface. Let's now speak about the global design of the storage diode. Uh, the idea was uh, pretty simple. So here on this uh, schema, you, will, you can see that on the left, we have a, a compute node of the dark side, and on the right, you, you have the server, the node, which will be outside the dark side. Basically, you take a compute node uh, attached to a, a parallel system such as Luster or GPFS, uh, which will mount the file system locally. You use another high speed interface directly connected to a JBOF, and uh, somehow, so it will change for I think every site, uh, some data will be uh, written, pushed between the parallel system and uh, the NVMe device. 
So it can be a demon, it can be a service, uh, it could be uh, some new feature in, in stuff like Robin Hood for Buster, uh, whatever, or even scripts. So, so it's, a, it's not important. So the outside node uh, has only one interface uh, in direct attach to the JBOF. So it will be on long distance, of course. Uh, but we don't want to, to put a, a switch here as we want security. Everything has to, uh, to, to stay in direct attach. So the design uh, looks of kind of uh, easy, but uh, what exactly uh, happens inside the JBOF and also uh, with the block level access only solution, uh, there is a problem about uh, locking at the file system level. So you can't do uh, whatever you have to do uh, really to be really uh, careful about what you do uh, if you don't want uh, some data corruption in your data. Uh, so inside the JBOF, uh, we will separate uh, the, the data pass uh, using dual ported drive. So one pass of the drive will be used for the write access and one pass of the drive will be used for the read access. And also inside the JBOF, uh, we will see a bit later that uh, you, you can uh, choose a, a fully separate solution or have some resiliency depending on what, uh, what we want to achieve. So about the uh, FBOF parameters. Uh, so we use uh, the two dual party drives to ensure the full separation, of course, between the two physical paths. Uh, here on the schema, you can see uh, the light blue uh, represents the FBOF or JBOF. Uh, in front of the, of the appliance, you, you will find some K200 cards, uh, which are basically NVMe OF, uh, Rocky, and CP target controller. Uh, these cards internally are connected to a PCIe switch. Uh, in this mode here, 1 by 16. And this switch or, uh, will be connected only by one side to the U.2 drive. And the other card uh, has the same access to the same drive, but through its other path. And between the uh, PCIe switch, there is a management CPU, uh, which uh, allows us to manage things such as a hot plug or failure or this kind of thing. So this is a, a fully separated access to the drive, and you can also uh, change the PCI bifurcation on, on depending on what you want to achieve. Uh, if you prefer to have redundancy intern internally inside the JBOF, it's also possible. So it means that we can uh, have some uh, separation at the PCI level or resiliency. So depending on the use case, uh, we are we, we do uh, we can adapt this uh, to uh, to customers so, which is uh, pretty cool so the provided solution so uh, just to summarize again so we have two nodes connected to an NVMe target controller uh, the two nodes are in direct connect we, we don't want any fabric so one node is uh, connected as read and write the other node will be connected only as read only uh, so it uh, it guarantees separated data pass and uh, the the protocol used will be a block level uh, of course because it's NVMe. Uh, so there still needs a, a file system or a file system <laughs> using internal locking at file level or containers. So uh, HDF five has been chosen uh, for the five representation and. Uh, we built it on the top on, a, on a, an XFS file system. And to do that, uh, you have to, not to hack, but to do some specific uh, configuration and modification. So you bypass uh, the entries and the local cache of uh, your Linux node. Uh, other, uh, other solutions are also possible. Uh, but we, what, we, what is important here is uh, that HDF5 has its own lock mechanism 
in, uh, internally inside the, inside each file. So we won't have any uh, access issue uh, from uh, either the write node or the reading node. So the architecture of the overview. So here on the left, we have the node A, which will be inside the dark side. It has read and write access, and it will be the HGFR writer. It's connected in direct connect uh, by NVMe OF to our K200 board. And the K200 board is a PCI root compact and serves a U.2 drive. The other port of the card is connected to the uh, outside node here on B uh, for the read only access, access. And uh, so this node will uh, act as an HDF5 reader. And, uh, and uh, it works because it has built in lock mechanism. So any uh, any node, uh, any file, sorry, which is still being written uh, has a lock internal by the writer. And so as long as uh, the lock is uh, on the writer, uh, nobody can read. Also, as this allows us to, um, uh, to add multiple readers, our, uh, our card supports different modes uh, of uh, internet. So by default, you have 100, 100 gig, but you can also use cable splitter uh, into multiple uh, uh, to have multiple uh, reading. So, for example, you can split uh, uh, 100 gig into 5 times 25, uh, uh, 4 times 10, uh, depending on what you want to achieve. So uh, the key elements of uh, this uh, design is that it's uh, ideal for warm workflows. So just as a reminder, warm is for white ones with many. Uh, and it's uh, very, it's hard to say exactly how many drives you need or how many boards you need because it's gonna, it's really going to depend on the size of the data which is written. Uh, how many files also uh, which is written. There are many small files or a few big files. So it's a balance to find between uh, the three parameters here. So the number of writers, the number of drives, uh, the, IOP, the IOPS you, you need to achieve in read and read, and of course the number of readers to a single target. So let's talk about the key benefits. So uh, there are three main aspects of this, on this solution in that it's uh, security focused. So we guarantee a read-only access from the outside world as the node is in direct attach. And uh, on the target side, you can control how, uh, who and how it connects. Uh, we ensure that uh, even in the worst case of someone has access to, the, to this node and has bad intention, in the worst case, you can access and maybe ping the target controller that won't be able to do much more than that. So the parallel fast system namespace is totally hidden because only the compute node pushing the data to the NVMe OF uh, target has, uh, has access to the parallel fast system. Uh, also, you can restrict NVMe access at the uh, NVMe level thanks to ACL. And uh, so the second point, which is very important on the solution, is that it's scalable. So it's really easy to scale. Uh, and it's, we offer the possibility to start small, for example, maybe one drive and one card. And on the top of that, you can build an entire solution and make it grow. So you can add some cards, you can add some drives, you can add uh, writer nodes, you can add reader nodes, or also you can a stack uh, a full, full diodes just to, uh, to add more storage and more IOPS to your system. Uh, so it's, uh, it's future proof as M MTPA is fully programmable. So it means we can deliver a code, code base on a regular basis, uh, depending on the NVMe evolution and uh, the speed of our development, of course. As we said, it's uh, easy to update thanks to the management interface. And also for uh, researcher or people who want to really dig inside the uh, MPPA, it's also possible to add custom code 
inside the cluster. So if you want to add some feature or extra security, uh, such as uh, filtering or uh, erasure coding, stuff like this. So thank you uh, uh, for following this presentation. And uh, I will be available on Slack to answer to all your questions. Thanks a lot.